Wonderful. It's 1.30 p.m. on Saturday, the 17th of July, here in Oxford, England. And uh, welcome to the final uh, presentation of our conference on natural theology in the 21st century. Um, the final speaker is the very well-known Professor Alison McGrath. And um, although a lot of people in the world want to do interdisciplinary work, very few people can do it well. And Alistair is one of them. And this is reflected by his uh, extraordinary range of qualifications. Uh, um, a doctoral doctor isn't easy, uh, and Alistair's got three of them. Uh, a doctoral degree in molecular biophysics, uh, a doctor of divinity degree in theology, and a doctor of letters degree in intellectual history. And this learning is reflected in his publications, which I think now, now number nearly or over 50 books. So an extraordinarily prolific writer. Some people can manage quantity, others manage quality, and Alistair manages both because um, these books are often uh, stunningly good. Um, it's very hard. I had to review one of them once for a journal. I couldn't, I had a problem. I couldn't write, have had anything negative to write because um, as far as I was aware, everything was absolutely perfect, intellectually speaking, in the, in the work. But not only that, um, some people can write about deep topics but can't communicate them. Uh, again, Alistair is very good, not just at depth, but in making the work accessible to people uh, from broad range of audiences. Having him at the Faculty of Theology in Oxford um, has been like having the first stage of a Saturn V rocket booster um, under the Ian Ramsey Centre and also the whole faculty, really. And it's made a big impact um, directly and indirectly in all kinds of ways for the Faculty of Theology. So um, it's fantastic. We've got a problem next year because he's finishing his time at Oxford. It's going to be a challenge to replace him. But um, anyway, I'm very grateful that he's joined us today at the end of his sabbatical year, actually. So it's a sort of a, break, a, a bit of a break from a break he's having, um, but uh, delighted that he could join us. And his topic today is um, natural theology, an interface between science and religion, question mark. Alistair. Well, thank you very much indeed. And it's a great pleasure to be able to speak again here at the In Rams Centre Conference. And I just want to begin by, if I may, thanking all those who have actually helped to arrange this conference on under what were rather difficult circumstances, uh, especially, of course, Andrew Pinsent, but also Bethany Solared. And of course, I also want to thank our plenary lecturers, Ian McGilchrist of Olivera Petrovich and Helen the cruise. So I have the privilege of wrapping things up and I think I want to really look at in this final lecture about natural theology as an interface um, and I think a very good place to begin our reflections is a sense of wonder that so many people have experienced at the immensity and the beauty of the natural world especially when you look at you know vast landscapes or, or look at the sky at night. And for the German poet Hermann Hesse, this was a, a trigger for reflection. It opened up new ways of thinking. And an experience of the immensity of nature often seems to create a sense of openness or receptivity towards an expanded vision of our world. So this idea of wonder expanding us, opening us up to new possibilities, I think is very important. And maybe that does lead to new ways of understanding things. But, you know, and both Olivera Petrovich and Helen de Cruz have pointed out that we need to think of natural theology as going beyond simply understanding. What about its affective dimensions? What about uh, beauty? Um, how does music come into this? I think these are very important points for us to think about as we reflect on natural theology. Let's go back to this idea of wonder, because the American psychologist Robert Fuller suggests that an experience of wonder, and I quote, momentarily suspends habitual ways of looking at the world and instead lures people into new and creative engagement with their surroundings. In other words, it's invitational. It expands our vision. It makes us receptive to rethinking and reimagining our world. So it can be, if you like, a gateway to a deeper understanding of our world. So for me, awe, wonder and amazement all have this capacity to create a desire to explore and understand our vast world. 
And I know many natural scientists, I'm sure all of you do as well, who uh, would trace their calling back to an overwhelming experience of awe in the solemn stillness of a night sky, or perhaps the astonishment of the diversity of light forms in the oceans. And certainly that happened to me back in the early 1960s when I looked at the night sky through a, a rather, rather small, rather amateurish homemade telescope. But, you know, I could see things like fuzzy patches of light that I knew were distant galaxies. And uh, I really wanted to go deeper into the fabric of this astonishing universe, which is why I decided I'd become a scientist. But you see, that sense of wonder can also be a gateway to another world, what we might call religious experience. And when I was at Oxford studying chemistry, I was reading Albert Einstein, and uh, Einstein talked about his own sense of rapturous amazement, it's a wonderful phrase, rapturous amazement at being able to figure out the laws of nature that govern our cosmos. But Einstein, you know, was very, very clear, we can only grasp part of our universe, it's so immense. But what we can see points to a greater unseen reality that lies beyond our, our, our capacity to actually see things. Um, Einstein famously said, look, if, if, um, if the universe is like a, a lion, then scientific observation shows us only the lion's tail. And Einstein talks about cosmic religious feeling. He means by that, I think, a sense of being overwhelmed by the natural world and made receptive to a greater spiritual reality, to, to a mind that lies behind the universe. So again, Einstein is saying a sense of wonder makes us receptive. It makes us want to think. It makes us want to expand our vision of the ways things are. Now, it's almost as if this sense of wonder or amazement expands our minds, making us receptive to deeper ways of understanding things. And psychologists like, for example, um, uh, Dacia Keltner tell us that the experience of awe or wonder is actually good for us because it directs our attention away from ourselves. It helps us to realize we're part of something that's greater than ourselves, and it makes us more generous towards others. But the key thing is it expands our minds and it makes us open to new intellectual possibilities. And so my question is, is one of these possibilities what we call natural theology. Is there some kind of interface, some kind of intellectual or imaginative borderland between science and religion? Now, obviously, this does lead us into some rather interesting but difficult um, debates about exactly what this term might mean. We've had some of that in our um, discussion groups um, and various communities of intellectual discourse take different uh, stands on what this term might mean and whether natural theology is admirable or deplorable. So I'm going to approach the question indirectly to try and avoid becoming enmeshed in these definitional disputes. And so I'm going to begin from a question. I want us to think about how we look at the natural world. And here's my question. What do we see? Again, what do we see? And Plato and Aristotle both answer this question using the idea of theoria, a way of beholding the world. Whether you like it or not, we already have these and they shape what we see. And sometimes they're wrong and they limit. And I'm sure you all know about Plato's analogy of the prisoners in the underground cave. It's a story he tells to talk about the importance of theoria, seeing things rightly. And the question is, is this world of shadows the real world or is there something grander and fuller that lies beyond it? And for Plato, a philosopher, someone who's seen a grander vision of reality, and tries to tell the people in the cave that actually there is a bigger, brighter world beyond the cave. What they see as reality is actually a place of captivity and the philosopher brings liberation. Now, here's the point I'm trying to make. We don't just see the natural world. We see it through a filter of assumption. We see it as something. And often these ways we see the world limit our grasp of what it's all about. And although many in the past have argued for a purely objective basis for scientific knowledge, I think actually theoretical and empirical are really 
intertwined. We have to take seriously the idea of theory-laden observation, which is the recognition that actually we find it very difficult to avoid looking at nature through um, some kind of theoretical spectacle. Sometimes we think we don't have them. But part of the scientific process lies in trying to identify our theoretical pre-commitments and then trying to work out whether actually there are better options. So which way of seeing the world is the best, is right, is true? I think many of us, certainly me, I, I find a remark by Ludwig Wittgenstein really helpful in wrestling with this point. And I'm sure many of you will know this quote. It's very short, a picture held as captive. Again, a picture held as captive. I think what Wittgenstein is saying here is that it is so easy for our understanding of our world to be controlled by a worldview or a meta-narrative that has, whether we realize it or not, come to dominate, even control our perception of the world. And the point is that this picture holds us captive in the sense that it predisposes us to interpret certain ways of understanding nature as being self-evidently correct, natural, if you like but blinding us to alternative and maybe better ways of understanding it. It makes us think that a certain way of reading the world that seems natural is the right way. But you know, this may just be a habit that we've acquired or a world that someone has imposed on us. And Wittgenstein's point is that we can get locked into certain limiting ways of seeing the natural world when actually there are others that are available and plausible. And one of these I want to suggest is natural theology. In other words, it's a committed way of looking at nature. You look at nature through a specific lens. Now, I'm sure some will say, well, look, um, that's just one option. Surely there is a neutral way of looking at the natural world. In effect, trying to disengage from any meta narrative, any interpretation of nature. And that's a very good question. And as many of you will know, the Canadian social philosopher Charles Taylor uses the phrase the neutral self, again, the neutral self, to describe the rather detached position of those who don't recognize the existence or the authority of any interpretive frameworks. They simply see themselves as being unanchored, unattached to any larger vision of reality. They're simply looking without any theoretical pre-commitments. Now, Taylor is very critical of this. Many of you will know his important idea of a social imaginary. Again, a social imaginary, which gives us a way of imagining our world, which allows us to kind of way place ourselves inside a vision of the larger order and then acting in accordance with this way of seeing things. And for Taylor, a social imaginary is that the way in which we imagine our social existence or see how we fit together with other people or have a sense of expectations or indeed have normative notions and images that underlie the way we think. He's saying we have these things. But here's the point he makes, and I think this is theologically very important. He says we need some kind of commitment to a way of thinking, some kind of imaginary. And he, he, he writes that we need what he calls, and this is his phrase, a frame or horizon within which things can take on a stable significance. That's a good phrase, a frame or horizon within which things can take on a stable significance. Because without this, we can't make sense of things. We can't derive moral values. So Taylor is saying, look, whether we like it or not, this is what we need to do. So again, I come back to my question. If we look at the natural world, what framework are we using? What other frameworks are there there? And one very obvious suggestion is that natural theology is about looking at nature through a theological lens. And this lens allows us to make a connection between the natural world and the transcendent, encouraging us to think that there is a connection and that it's meaningful. Now, in many ways, this was the default assumption um, of the early modern period. We find, for example, in early modern uh, natural philosophers like Johannes Kepler in Germany or Robert Boyle here in uh, England, not merely in England, in Oxford. 
And writers of this period use the term physico-theology, physico-theology, from the Greek word physikos, meaning natural. And this is all about trying to work out what could be known of nature through the natural world. And I think this may have been um, an apologetic device. It uh, was seen as being helpful in, in affirming the rationality of religious belief in an age when religious skepticism was beginning to become significant. But I think it's also important to note that this approach to theology seemed to offer a way of doing theology without becoming involved in the kinds of rather unpleasant sectarian debates about theology that had emerged in England during the English Civil War. So that's an important point. But you know, there's a really important point about this approach to natural theology that people very often overlook. One of the most important outcomes of this physical theology was the enhanced quality of affective engagement with the natural world that it permitted and encouraged. Robert Boyle, who I think is the most significant advocate of this approach, saw this physical theological approach to nature as being almost like a spiritual exercise. It moved you away from a theoretical detachment from nature towards the cultivation of a reverential or respectful attitude towards nature on account of what it represents. And what Boyle is really saying is that um, nature is not simply an object for study, it's potentially a source of wisdom. We don't just learn about nature, we learn from nature. And Boyle makes this point in a very interesting passage. He, he writes that um, natural philosophy has made discoveries in the book of nature, uh, and this excites them and qualifies them all the better to praise the author whose goodness doesn't uh, so well matches up with the wisdom they celebrate. So there's a theme that I think we might come back to. Natural theology is not simply about learning about nature. It's about learning from nature, challenging us to rethink what we believe. Now, um, this approach to natural theology was not really seen as a proving the existence of God, although, of course, it could be helpful. But nevertheless, there was this basic idea, there was this resonance between theology and observation of the natural world. I mentioned Kepler a few moments ago. Kepler, I don't know if you knew, know this, studied theology at the University of Tübingen, and he could see connections between natural philosophy and natural theology. And we find this, for example, in his idea that the human mind, which bears the image of God, in effect, is naturally predisposed towards mathematics, because mathematics had its origins in the mind of God. Here's a very famous passage from his book, The Harmony of the World, and I'm quoting here from Kepler. Geometry is part of the divine mind from the origins of time and has provided God with the patterns for the creation of the world and has been transferred to humanity with the image of God. In other words, there's a theological reason for talking about the ordering of the world and there's a theological reason for talking about the capacity of the human mind to discern that order. In other words, this dilemma Einstein famously identified that the eternal mystery of the world is its explicability. Actually, Kepler has an explanation for that. Now, I'm going to look at how two scientists with theological interest develop these connections between natural science and theology in developing their own approaches to natural theology. So I'm going to look at two figures who I think are both very significant in the field of science and religion. They've been important to us at the Ian Ramsey Center. And sadly, these are two people who we lost during the last 12 months. Now, I'm talking about John Barrow, who was professional professor of mathematical physics at Cambridge, who died of cancer on, in September of last year. And of course, John Polkinghorne, a former mathematical professor of physics at Cambridge, who died um, in, in March of this year. Both of these scholars were given the Templeton Prize for Progress in Religion. And what I want to do is simply pay tribute to them by considering their views on natural theology. If they were here, what might they say to us as we think about this theme of natural theology? Now, as I'm sure you will know, 
uh, Barrow, uh, along with Frank Tipler, wrote a book that propelled him to prominence within the science and religion community, and of course, way beyond that. And this is the 1986 book, The Anthropic Cosmological Principle. That's a long time ago, but actually that propelled this idea of the anthropic principle from the pages of rather obscure journals to popular culture. And Barrow and Tipler were really saying that the idea of purpose and design needed to be brought back into reflection about the natural world. And the book actually is very helpful and to all of us engaged in science and religion in a kind of way uh, helped uh, solidify the impression this was a respectable field of discovery. But interestingly, uh, Barrow has kept on talking about these themes since then, including in some lectures given here in Oxford during the late 1990s. And in those lectures, uh, Barrow talked about um, two different ways of thinking about um, the laws of nature and natural theology. One approach he finds in William Paley's very famous book, Natural Theology of 1802. This is based on what Barrow calls the nice outcomes of the laws of nature. Again, the nice outcomes of the laws of nature. In other words, the laws of nature lead to certain outcomes. That's really good for us because we're here. But of course, um, this, is, this is vulnerable because God is too easily eliminated from that argument. But interestingly, Barrow's saying, no, no, let's look instead at a second approach which is nice laws. The fact that those laws are there, the fact that they take the form they do is immensely significant. And that's the thing we should be focusing on. Because if the universe came into existence in an astonishingly short time, already possessing the laws that govern its development, then the question of the origin and character of those laws becomes a question of major theological, major apologetic importance. And as Barrow points out, I mean, this, this approach to the design argument is much harder to explain without reference to God, because the laws of nature didn't kind of come into being by a random process. They are there. They are imprinted on the way the universe is. So Barrow, in many ways, kick-started a very important discussion about fine-tuning, and a constant theme that emerges from this is that the anthropic principle, however you state this, whether weak or strong, is actually very strongly consistent with belief in God. And so Theus, with a firm commitment to a doctrine of creation, will find the fine-tuning of the universe to be a retrodictive confirmation of their religious beliefs. Now, sure, this is not about proving God's existence. It's much more about saying that, in effect, this is completely consistent with what Christians and others believe. But let me, if I may, give you a quote from Barrow himself. This is, in my view, Barrow's best one-liner. He writes these words. A universe simple enough to be understood is too simple to produce a mind capable of understanding it. I say it again, I like this. A universe simple enough to be understood is too simple to produce a mind capable of understanding it. So that's John Barrow, we miss him, as we do John Polkinghorn. Now in the case of John Polkinghorne's case, we have a mathematical physicist with a more developed interest in Christian theology, who could see how his own uh, background in theoretical physics and his interest in quantum theory led him to, in effect, regenerate uh, a particular approach to natural theology. And in the 1995 essay, The New Natural Theology, which a lot of people have referenced in the discussion groups we've been having, Polkinghorne argues that there's a new interest in natural theology, and it comes mainly from within the scientific community itself. And that's a very important point. There's a scientific impetus, a scientific motivation for wanting to look at this. And Polkinghorne writes uh, these words about this new approach to natural theology. Its character, he writes, is different from that of its predecessors. For the new natural theology is not only revived, but revised. So what does he mean? Well, I think there's several things he's getting at. One of them is that uh, there's a change in ambition. The uh, 
kind of natural theology Paul Kinghorn wants us to do is more modest in its claims. It's not claiming to prove God's existence. What's saying is that its approach offers a broader engagement with the nature, which offers a much more satisfying account of nature than its atheist alternatives. Now, again, people have been talking a lot about Alvin Plantinga um, during the discussions we've been having. And Alvin Plantinga is a philosopher who'd make this point, but from a more philosophical perspective. So there's a change in its ambition, but there's a second divergence, and that is that for Paul Kinghorn, natural theology is not a competitor, not a rival to natural sciences. It wants to do business with them. It wants to be, in effect, seen as part of the natural scientific enterprise. So I think there's a really interesting point here. Paul Kinghorn is quite clear that science doesn't seem to uh, need theological supplementation. But it does raise questions which it can't answer on the basis of its own working methods and resources. And therefore, in effect, it raises what are very often religious questions which it can't answer and therefore invites the question who can answer these questions. And that's, that's about a dialogue with theology. It's very important. Here's what Paul Kinghorn says about what he calls meta questions. It's a good word, meta questions. These are questions that are raised by science that science can't answer. Meta questions that arise from our scientific experience and understanding point us beyond what science by itself can presume to speak about. Well, it's, it's a great idea. But what does he mean by it? Well, here's one meta question. Why is science possible in the first place? Now, I mean, a uh, lot of scientists will talk about this, but in the end, I mean, the answer is going to be, well, well, it is, and we do it. But it does need explanation because otherwise it's just a sheer piece of good luck. And Paul says, look, we, we cannot rest with that explanation. We want to know why the physical universe is so rationally transparent. Why can we discern its pattern and structure? It's so interesting, so important. Why is it that some of the most beautiful patterns proposed by pure mathematicians are actually found to occur in the structure of the physical world? So in effect, what Paul Kinghorn is doing is setting the context for doing natural theology. He's not in any way critiquing theologians who want to do this, but he's saying there's a particular, particularly important way of doing this, which is responding to the questions that scientists ask, which science can't answer. Like, why is science possible in the first place? Why is there something rather than nothing? So Paul Kinghorn, if you like, is moving away from the traditional idea of natural theology as a freestanding way of demonstrating God's existence. Um, his argument is that natural theology offers us an enhanced insight into the way the world is by complementing, by supplementing the sciences rather than trying to displace them. So what I find interesting about both Barrow and Paul Kinghorn is that both of them are attentive, they're engaged scientists, but both of them are aware that their specialist field raised these deeper questions that science can't answer. And so in many ways, these are people who have discovered the importance of theology and want to create conceptual space for a dialogue, a discussion. What I want to say is, for all of us at the Ian Ramsey Center, and indeed much wider than this, it's really important that we engage those questions and occupy, if you like, that conceptual space. Now, I don't want to suggest that my own conversations with natural scientists are representative, but I cannot help but notice how many of them want to talk about the religious significance of the study of nature, and its beauty, or the ability of the human mind to make so much sense of our world. So again, back to John Barrow's one-liner, a universe simple enough to be understood is too simple to produce a mind capable of understanding it. You can see that that moves us in some very interesting directions. 
Now, I find all this really interesting, and I wish I had time to engage these issues in more detail. But my point is that both Barrow and Polkinghorne are helping us to see that there is interest in these questions and also beginning to give us some ideas about how we could engage these questions from within the discipline of science and religion and, of course, from theology. But what I want to do now, if I may, is go back to that theme I picked up briefly when looking at early modern natural theology, namely the cultivation of attentiveness towards the natural world. It's there in Kepler, it's there in a big way in the writings of Robert Boyle. And the point I'm going to make is that theology gives us both a motivation and a lens for paying close attention to nature through its emphasis on the natural order as the creation that points to the creator and thus serves as a visible and tangible expression of the nature of God. Now, it seems to me that we need to highlight uh, the role of natural theology here in relation to the ministry and outreach of the churches. Uh, I'm going to make this point very clearly in looking at this idea of cultivating attentiveness towards nature. But it's very interesting because um, the first major work that deals explicitly with natural theology was written by the Catalan writer Ramundo de Sabonde in 1436. He called it the knowledge of the book of created things, but we know that book by the subtitle of its second edition, which is Natural Theology. And interestingly, uh, although Sabon's work was used to try and um, affirm the rationality of belief in God in later centuries, actually, if anything, the original version of the work is a work of spirituality, not apologetics. It's about enabling people who do not have access to a Bible to deepen their knowledge and appreciation of God through the contemplation and appreciation of the natural world. This idea of an attentiveness to nature seems to me to be very important for Christian theology and spirituality, and of course is relevant to the field of science and religion. Let me just explore some people, some themes that I think might be helpful resources in this discussion. The seventh century Byzantine theologian Maximus the Confessor is a very good example of an early Christian writer who's well aware of the interplay between theology and the contemplation of nature. Listen, listen to this from him. So the soul flees towards the intellectual contemplation of nature as to the inside of a church, to a place of peaceful sanctuary, and there it learns to recognize the essential meanings of things as if through the readings from Holy Scripture. Now, uh, for those of you who were in that particular discussion group yesterday, who heard a presentation by Eugenia Torrance of Notre Dame University on Maximus, you'll know how interesting this approach is, and perhaps you can see how it can be developed further. But we also find it in the medieval Franciscan theologian Bonaventure, who followed in the tradition of Francis of Assisi. And again, the theme is respect nature, care for it, and appreciate it. We need to see nature, and here I quote Bonaventure, as a means of self-revelation, so that like a mirror of God or a divine footprint, it might lead us to love and praise our creator. Now, Bonaventure actually really isn't talking in terms of rational proof of God's existence. It's much more about natural theology mapping an intellectual pathway which leads us into God's presence. It, it's not really the language of proof. It's more, it begins a journey. And as you journey in this way, you will find yourself drawn towards God. As you become aware of the vastness, the intricacy, and the beauty of nature, and begin to reflect on what God must be like to have made that in the first place. Now you find this attentiveness towards nature also in some secular writers. But what I'm going to make is that theology gives you an enhanced motivation. The motivation is already there. Theology enhances it. And then it helps us understand where this journey is taking us. But let me give a good example of a secular writer who is fully aware of this importance of taking nature seriously, being attentive towards it. This is Henry Miller. Henry Miller, a very famous novelist, very, very good writing style. This is one of his reflections 
on nature. And I quote, the moment one gives close attention to anything, even a blade of grass, it becomes a mysterious, awesome, indescribably magnificent world in itself. It's like Chaucer and the daisy. You know, he, he said, you've got to be able to take time to get down on your knees and look at a daisy. So looking at nature's good, here's my point. A theological lens heightens our attentiveness towards nature and enriches our understanding and appreciation of God. And many of you will know this is a classic feature of um, many works of what we might call natural history. For example, John Ray's 1691 book, The Wisdom of God Manifest in the Works of Creation. Appreciate nature and then appreciate God even more. It's that kind of line of thought which makes perfect sense. But a writer who I think illustrates this most clearly is the 17th century English poet and theologian Thomas Traherne. And I think he, he gives us a, a wonderful example of a theologically informed and a theologically attentive reading of the natural world. And in many ways, Traherne anticipates Miller's attentiveness to the intricacy of nature, but makes explicit theological connections. And these transcend a surface reading of the natural world. So listen to this and try and see the point he's making. This is Traherne speaking now. You never enjoy the world aright till you see how a sand exhibits the wisdom and power of God and prize in everything the service which they do you by manifesting his glory and goodness to your soul, far more than the visible beauty on their surface or the material services they can do your body. Now, the point he's making is that it's not enough to appreciate the beauty of nature or indeed the benefits that the natural world provides for our comfort and survival. We need to go behind and beyond a surface reading of nature and see it as a set of signs pointing to God and illuminating the human situation. So we cover a lot of ground in this lecture, but I now need to turn back, so to speak, and look at some more explicitly theological issues. And I want to try and reflect on what natural theology might be, because as you will know, in the discipline of philosophy of religion, which is very well represented at this conference, the term natural theology tends to be widely used to mean something like this, the branch of philosophy, which investigates what human reason, unaided by revelation, can tell us concerning God. And many of you will take that as the default understanding of what natural theology is. And I have no objection to that. But the point is the history of use of the term actually points to a, a wider understanding of that term. Uh, and I think it's helpful just to try and tease out the ways in which it was understood. I mean, let me give you four uh, that I see in the tradition, and uh, they're, they're different, but you could argue they actually are complementary. First of all, it might refer to relying on natural human reasoning to find our way to God. In other words, it's, what is natural here? It's natural human reason, not looking at nature, we're just reasoning, which is what, of course, we find in Anselm of Canterbury's ontological argument. But then, of course, you might say, well, no, no, we're not just reasoning naturally, we're reasoning naturally about nature. And the question then is, what form of reasoning makes the most sense of the natural order itself? Uh, and we've heard many people in the discussion groups talking about Alvin Plantinger and Richard Swinburne. Both these philosophers argue that God is the best explanation for the complex patterns of phenomena that we observe in the natural world. For example, here's what Richard Swinburne has to say. Many of you will know this quote. I am postulating a God to explain what science explains. I do not deny that science explains, but I postulate God to explain why science explains. You see the pattern. It's like poking hole and meta questions. Uh, what Swinburne is saying is, look, science explains, but we need to explain why science explains. Theology helps us with that. The existence of God may, Swinburne argues, be inferred from what's observed in the world. 
That was the second option. The third is basically what John Porky once sets out, seeing some kind of resonance or, 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 or um, a consonance between theological and scientific engagement of the world. They're not, not the same, but they kind of are entangled. They're pointing in the same direction. And basically, Pokemon's argument is that kind of Christianity gives you a, a framework which seems to make a lot more sense of scientific observations than alternatives. Or fourth, we might think of natural theology as the way of seeing nature that originates from within uh, a set of theistic assumptions. In other words, the direction of travel here is not from nature to God, but if you like, from God to nature. Uh, it's from a community of faith and then asking from within that community of faith, what perspective do we bring to the observation of the world? And remember, there's no neutral way of observing the world. There's always a degree of pre-commitment. And that, of course, would be a theology of nature, if like a theological reading or interpretation of a natural world. And we might, of course, go back to a metaphor which has been talked about by several people throughout this conference, which is the idea of God's two books, which um, you can track back to the early modern period and early medieval period, probably beyond that. And the idea is that God is the author or creator of two distinct books, the book of nature and the book of scripture, or to change the imagery, the book of God's works and the book of God's words. And this invites us to see nature as a text which can be read, but which requires interpretation. And the book of scripture provides us with a hermeneutical scheme for interpreting the natural world. If you like, the book of scripture helps us read the book of nature, which allows us to avoid a surface reading or a materialist reading of nature, and helping us to appreciate both its beauty, but also what it is pointing to. And so you might think then of, of holding these two books together and rejoicing in the deeper and wider understanding of things that it makes possible. So what I've been saying here is that natural theology gives us an interface between science and religion. It's a way of looking at the world which is rooted in a faith tradition, but which seems to make an awful lot of sense of things and which gives us a lens which we can bring to look at the natural world. So am I being disrespectful of those who don't share these theistic bridging assumptions, which allow the correlation of discussions about the natural order and about God? Well, you know, I hope not. I mean, I think one of the challenges we all face is to develop intellectual empathy. And that means entering into somebody else's way of thinking and then exploring the landscape that this makes possible. You need to accept it's right, but it's, it's about exploring this. And so in many ways, what I'm saying is um, that natural theology is a way of thinking which leads to this landscape. And in many ways, I'm saying let, let's, let's use intellectual empathy to try and explore this way of thinking and evaluate it. So let me go back to that quote from Wittgenstein, a picture held as captive. And I'm really someone who discovered what, what I thought was the only picture actually was restrictive and impoverishing, and that there were other intellectual landscapes available. But as I bring this lecture to a close, let me say how important it is on, in the light of the kind of lines of argument I've been developing for churches and other religious communities to explore the value of natural theology in enriching their appreciation of the natural world and hence their commitment to protecting it in the face of commercial exploitation and industrial degradation. And one of the things I want to emphasize is we need to practice inhabiting this way of thinking and make sure we get the most out of using it. Now listen, there's a lot more I could say, but I really do need to bring this lecture to an end. Uh, and um, I, you know, I, I know all of us involved in organizing this conference want to thank our, our speakers, both in plenary sessions and short papers for opening up so many interesting questions. And it's been great fun. And, and we, we do hope we will see you next year, and maybe, maybe here in Oxford. But actually, we've learned a lot in organizing this virtual conference. So if we have to use this format again next year, it's going to be even better than this year. Thank you so much for listening.
Well, thank you very much, uh, Alastair. And I see already people got their hands up. So let's launch off. Um, I think of Father Oskari from Finland. Thanks so much. Thank you, uh, Alistair, for a wonderful lecture. And I was really pleased to see the importance you gave to the idea of the two books. I've spent the last couple of years exploring the earlier history of that metaphor, the patristic and early medieval mm. idea of the book of nature. And um, uh, one of the things that um, kind of struck me in, in that earlier history, which covers especially the, the, the school of Alexandria and Augustine, and then Maximus the Confessor, of course, is kind of culmination point, um, was the, the difference precisely that you, you brought up, that it was very rarely used in the sense of proving the existence of God, but um, rather exploring the riches that God has given to mankind through those two books. And uh, in a sense, I'm wondering what caused, if, if supposing that we ever lost it really, if we haven't completely lost that tradition, but what may have caused that tendency in theology itself to somehow focus maybe more exclusively on scripture, if you have any thought on that, because I'm wondering how to how we could advance that perspective more in theology itself in the broader sense that um, it's coming back now, obviously, in, with all this um, science engaged theology and so on, but at least in more typical systematic theology that I've studied myself, it's rather absent. So if you have any thought on how we could mm. bring it back more as part mm. of ordinary mm. theology? Yeah. Okay, that's very good. I, I think um, you're quite right. This, this, this way of thinking, the two books tradition goes way, way back. And actually, I mean, if you look at, for example, well, Hugh of St. Victor is a very good example in, in, in um, Paris. I mean, there's no apologetic agenda at all in, in what he's doing. He's simply saying, yeah, this makes sense. It helps me to appreciate the natural world more, and it's very well developed, but he does not use it to affirm the rationality of faith. He's saying it's an expression of it. It's kind of way, just the way things are. We need to appreciate it. Um, so I think what I, as I look at the history of natural theology, what I see happening is it becomes apologetically important in situations where there is uh, uncertainty about the authority of traditional theological resources, or, and you want to use nature as a kind of common language to connect up with other people, or you believe that actually you can use an appeal to nature as a way of showing that a purely materialist reading of nature is inadequate. So I, that's a very important point to do. Um, and so one of the questions then is how we can begin to retrieve this kind of tradition. And, you know, actually, that, your own work is very important here. Uh, what you might want to think of doing is trying to provide a, a popular level book or some popular level articles, which, in effect, set out what this method is and show how you can use it, because that always is the problem. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of modern theologians still have this tendency to say, well, you know, back then you know, in, in Alexandria, well, you know, we can't take that seriously. But of course, you know, it's a very different world. We do need to take it seriously. And I think that someone like you perhaps could help us to, to make that reconnection. I'm sure it can be done. We just need someone to help us to actually make those connections. So thank you for a very, very good question. Thank you. I believe Abuki Fatono is next. Abuki one of our students, by the way, in uh, uh, studying for a doctorate at Oxford. And uh, we've got students from all over the world, and uh, it's wonderful. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for that, Alistair. I really enjoyed it. Um, you mentioned two kinds of books um, that's authored by God, um, and Book of Nature and the Word of God. In around the same time, in the medieval period, there was this idea of memory as a book or a scrinium, a, a, a box in which you kept lots of books. And I wondered if this is a third kind of book that's authored by God, and maybe what they're trying to say is that there is something in us that recalls God, and I think that's Augustine's point. Yes, 
Yeah, again, this is a very interesting point. I mean, I mean, Augustine triggered off um, this, this very interesting kind of introspective way of thinking whereby you didn't just look outside the natural world. Augustine has this idea, look, you, you travel to look at mountains, at lakes, at seas, but you, you don't think enough about yourself because, you, you know, you, who you are, what you're made up of is very significant. And of course, the caverns of memory, that's one of the things he says, there's something very significant about that. And Augustine, um, I mean, obviously, you know, not everyone would agree with his line of argumentation, but you can see that it, it, it opens up some very interesting questions because Augustine is in effect asking questions like, um, do we, without realizing it, recall once being in paradise and experiencing the sense of cognitive dissonance that we now experience in the world? We feel we don't belong here because we have a memory of belonging somewhere else. And of course, you'd have to say, well, you, know, you can't have an individual memory, but if you've got a corporate memory, something like that. So it is very, very interesting. And what I would say is that um, one of the things, reasons I quite like reading C.S. Lewis is that I see him as a contemporary exponent of this kind of approach. Mm -hmm. And um, in Lewis, you do have this very experientially orientated approach to theology, which isn't really looking at the book of nature or the book of scripture. It's much more looking at what we might loosely call the book of experience and saying that the book of experience can also be interpreted in terms of the book of um, scripture. And that gives you an added conceptual resource. So I think you're quite right to say that um, there are more possibilities at our disposal than I have indicated in this lecture. Uh, Helen de Cruz opened up some very important points to Olivia Petrovich. And I think that actually, you know, if I, if I can just put it like this, I mean, there are so many possible starting points for natural theology that we are spoiled for choice. Um. Thank you again, Alistair. Uh, and I've noticed uh, I've left the record button on, so I'm going to turn it off now, as we don't normally record uh, the uh, questions and answers. So um, we'll bring this lecture to a close on in terms of our recording. <laughs>